Okay, we're live. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, if you can hear me, maybe type something in the chat so that I know that this is working correctly. Should all be set up, but I'd just like to make sure real quick here. In fact, I can do this. Can I hear myself? Great. Okay. Okay. So, this is the first lecture. I uh, hope that you're all doing well under the circumstances. Great. Hope that you're all doing well under the circumstances. And what we're going to do. Uh, for this first attempt at this is we're just going to do the lecture as normal. So I'm going to run through the slides and then I will answer questions in the chat afterwards. And then of course you can always contact me for follow up and I'll stay online until the end of the normal class sessions. People have time to ask questions. A um, couple of business things. Your exams have not been entered yet. They are graded. I'm waiting for one person to finish their makeup exam, so that will be up soon, and I'll send an announcement about that. And there will be an extra credit assignment uh, posted to Canvas today, and that will be available for you to do extra credit. Okay, so to the lecture. This week, we are starting a new section on primates. So there's an introduction to primates. Oh, and I'm changing the syllabus slightly because the week where I was going to a conference, that conference, of course, has been canceled. And so I'm going to expand the schedule a little bit. We won't take that week off. Um, we'll do chapter 10 this week and chapter 11 next week instead of squeezing them all into this week's material. And so I'll send a revised copy of the syllabus with that information around as well. So introduction to primates. Um, we're going to be looking at the basic concepts of primates, what they are, who they are, they're us, we are primates, and how studying primates as part of anthropology can give us some information about what human beings are like and what our cultures are like. So what are our objectives for today? Um, we need to understand the basics of taxonomy and classification. That is, how do we describe species and arrange them? This is material from chapter nine, and we're not gonna do chapter nine in a complete way, but we're just gonna cover a few points from it that are necessary for us to do chapter 10. And then where do humans fit in to classification schemes? What is a species? So before we can talk about different species and how they compare to each other, we have to know what a species actually is. Um, what are analogous and homologous characteristics? So, so uh, how do we look at certain traits and define them based on where they come from in evolution? What is a primate? So what are, what are the other animals that are in our group? Uh, what is the arrangement of primate taxonomy. So how do the different kinds of primates relate to each other? And what are the characteristics of the main kinds of primates? So after we get these basics down, I'll run through the entire primate family tree and hit the highlights of what their traits are. And then we'll go into more detail on those, on those questions next week. And I notice here that my streaming software is telling me that I may have some dropped frames. So let me know if there's a lot of lag um, and if it's a big issue, I will re-record this for the final video that I post so that it's more smooth. All right, so classification. What is classification? Well, at one time, natural scientists, uh, people who studied biology, just described animals based on their characteristics. So when the first explorers came to the Americas and they saw things like wild turkeys, they didn't have a way to classify it. They just drew it and they said it looks a lot like certain kinds of birds that we're familiar with from Europe, like pheasants. It's a weird American pheasant. And that went on for a long time. But during the Enlightenment, people started to wonder about how they could 
um, classify species in systematic ways and figure out how they were related to each other. So this gentleman here, Carl Linnaeus, known as the father of taxonomy, he didn't develop the first taxonomic system, but he developed the taxonomic system that we use today. And his whole goal was to describe how different species relate to one another. Originally, he was only interested in plants, but then while on a botanical expedition, he saw a lot of animal remains and it occurred to him that he could describe animals based on things like how many teeth they had, the shapes of their skeletons, and he felt like he could come up with a system to relate them all together and he spent the rest of his life then working on that. So where do we stand in the Linnaean classification system? We are here. So. The highest level is the kingdom, animalia, or animals, and that includes a huge number of species. The phylum that we're in is chordata, that's all the animals that have a spine. Then we're in the class mammalia, all the mammals. So lizards, for instance, are chordata, but they are not mammalia. Within mammalia, we're in the order of primates, the first order, because Linnaeus being a 18th century Scientists thought, of course, that humans were the best animal, and so he put us first. The family Hominidae, and then genus Homo species sapiens. And you can see that species is the most specific category. That's how we define it. All you have to know is genus and species. Those are the most important things. So what are scientific names telling us and how are they structured. Every scientific name is binomial, which is just Latin for name with two parts. And the form is always genus species. The genus is always capitalized and the species is always lower, lowercase. And the name should always be in italics when you're writing it in text. So I have an example there. Homo sapiens and Homo erectus, both in italics, are later species than Australopithecus afarensis. And even though Australopithecus Australopithecus afarensis appears in the middle of the sentence, the genus is capitalized. And then if you were to write a paper using a lot of species references, which we're not going to do in this class, after writing the name out once, you can abbreviate the genus every time it appears from then on. So the next paragraph could say H. sapiens is also a later species than H. erectus. And all of the early species names um, that Linnaeus developed are just Latin versions describing what those animals are. So there's a little cartoon about that here. Tyrannosaurus rex means tyrant lizard king. Canis familiaris just means domestic dog. And then later it got more complicated when people started naming species after other people or things. So there is, for instance, a flower that's named after Carl Linnaeus, and then it gets more complicated from there. But for many species, um, the scientific name just describes them in Latin. So then the next question is, what is a species? And there are different species concepts, different definitions of what a species is. But what we're going to use in this class is the biological species concept. So in the biological species concept, a species is a group of organisms that can A, breed together, and B, produce viable offspring. And what does that mean? Viable offspring are children that are living and fertile, that is, they're also able to reproduce. So humans, if two humans mate, they will have a child, that child will be alive, and that child will also be fertile. It'll be able to mate with other humans and produce more humans. A counterexample is that a horse and a donkey, which are two separate species, can mate and they can have offspring. Those are called mules. So a mule is a cross between a horse and a donkey, but mules are sterile. Therefore, they are not a species. They're what's called a hybrid. So horses and donkeys are related and they can interbreed, but they're not the same species. And so horses are defined as Equus cabalus, donkeys are defined as Equus equinius asinus. Now, this is the species concept we're gonna use, but of course there's always exceptions to it. So for instance, most canids, and canids are dogs, wolves, coyotes, dingoes, uh, African wild dogs, a couple of other exceptions. They are defined as separate species. They can all interbreed. You can, uh, and not create hybrids. You can cross a dog and a wolf. You can cross a wolf and a coyote, and they will have 
viable offspring. Yeah, another example uh, is ligers. So if you've ever seen Napoleon Dynamite, they talk about ligers. Those are crosses between lions and tigers. And some ligers, not all, but some ligers are able to have viable offspring with other ligers. So there's always exceptions. And then all of this gets really complicated later when we discuss fossil humans, because for the most part, we can't tell if they had viable offspring, but we tend to distinguish the species of human ancestors from each other based on very, very fine characteristic differentiations. And so there's a lot of debate about where the lines between species are drawn in fossil humans. And we'll get into that in about three weeks. All right, so taxonomy and phylogeny. Taxonomy is the science of classification and nomenclature, so determining where all these species differentiate and arranging them. And phylogeny is any system that indicates the relationships, the evolutionary relationships between organisms. And in the Linnaean system, that's based mostly on physical traits. So if animal A and animal B are physically similar and animal C is physically different, then we assume that animal A and animal B are more closely related. Um, more recently, the, the development of genetic sequencing has led to genetic phylogeny trees, and we're starting to find out that some animals are not as closely related as they would physically appear, and they're more genetically related to other animals, and that's changing our view of a lot of phylogenies. So, for instance, bats, which were for a long time thought to be closely related to mice, uh, now actually appear to be more closely related to cats. And that's something that is being developed. When we look at those physical characteristics, we look at analogous characters. So those are characters that are shared among organisms because they have a similar adaptation. And homologous characters. Those are characters that are shared because the species have a more recent common ancestor. And we'll look at what those kinds of characters are. So, an analogous character is a physical character that is developed because there are physical similarities in the way that the organism behaves. So the great example is wings. Okay, There are many species with wings. Many of those species are not related at all. They all have the same function, which is to allow that organism to fly. Right. So those analogous characters are functionally similar. They might be morphologically different. So you can see here that bat wings and bird wings have completely different bone structures because bats and birds come from completely different evolutionary lines. And then you have things like butterfly wings, right? So here we have something that's not even in the order Animalia. It's an insecta but it has the same function, a large surface that you flap to move around. Then on the other hand, you have homologous characters, and we're going to be looking mostly at homologous characters. We're not going to look at a lot of analogous characters. Homologous characters exist because you have a common ancestor. So the great example is hands, right, four limbs, all mammals have roughly similar forelimbs. Look at the bone structure. And if you look at our hands and chimpanzee hands on the right hand there, you can see that they're extremely similar. Right? Their hand is something that we would recognize clearly as a hand. But all other mammals have those same bone arrangements, even though they have different functions. So on the bottom here, you can see the comparison. The human hand, the cat, front paw, the whale front flipper and the bat wing, those are all evolved from the same set of bones. So the different colored bones all match together there. Whales have a humerus and a radius and an ulna just like we do. They're just different shaped and they've evolved to fulfill different functions. And so because we're going to look at individuals that are similar to us, we're going to look at a lot of homologous characters. So why study non-human primates at all? Why are we doing primatology? One, there are closest biological relatives. So remember that anthropology is based on the comparative method. And so if we want to compare ourselves to something that's not ourselves, the closest thing we can compare it to is non-human primates. 
and a lot of them are very similar to us in a lot of ways. Um, what distinguishes the primates from other mammals? That's a big question that we have. We can look at morphological comparisons. So how do how are we more similar to monkeys than we are to say dogs? And then we can look also at their behavior. So how how does the behavior of primates compare to our behavior? And what can we tell about our behavior by studying the behavior of primates? This also allows us to understand our evolutionary past. So we have common ancestors with primates. At one time, there was only one or two species um, from which we all evolved. So why did they evolve differently than us? Why did we evolve to be the way that we are? And we can look at a whole bunch of different areas, right? So we can look at anatomy, we can look at intelligence, we can look at diet, and we can look at behavior. And those are our things that we'll drill down into more deeply in the coming lectures. So then, what is a primate? All the primates fall into the order mammalia, and so then the first question would be, what do all mammals have in common with each other? So we all have mammary glands, that's where the name comes from. We produce milk to feed our offspring. Many species outside of mammalia don't have that. So if you are, you know, hatched from an egg, uh, then you there's no mammary gland, there's no milk involved, for instance. We all have fur. So think about rats on the far end of mammalia from us, right? Rats, cats, dogs, they all have fur. Humans only have a little fur, right? But we still have it. All, mamma all mammalia developed from a fetus in a womb. So again, no eggs. Well, there are biological eggs, but we're not hatched from an egg, right? We all give birth to live young. So again, rats, cats, dogs, humans, all the same, give birth to live babies. And they're distributed in tropical and subtropical areas around the world. So there are no um, primates that are native to, say, Antarctica, um, or to the ext extreme, uh, extreme physiographic areas. So that includes all the primates, which are human beings, apes, monkeys, uh, tarsiers, lorises, and lemurs, and we'll look at those in some more detail. So what do all primates have in common? Here's the list. And on the right, we have a chimpanzee hand. And so you can look at that hand and think about how it's relatively similar to our hand. Right? There are a lot of familiar features there, except for the color and the length of the fingers. And that could be pretty much a hairy human hand. So all primates have a grasping hand with an opposable thumb. And that opposable thumb is one of the things that makes us distinct from most other mammals. All of our hands and feet have five digits. So there are other species that don't have five digits. They have four or two, right? Ungulates have a split toe with only two. We have nails rather than claws. So you can see here that the chimpanzee fingernail is pretty much exactly like a human fingernail. And you can compare that to a cat or a dog, which has a claw on the end. Um, we all have a clavicle. Not all animals have a largely extant clavicle, so our, our collarbone um, is the same as the collarbone in all other primates. We have two bones in the forearm, so we discussed this in the anatomy section. The two bones in the forearm allow us to twist our arm and turn our hand over, which, for instance, a dog or a cat cannot do. They have to bend their arm around. We mostly have enclosed eye orbits, so remember that the skull you have a bone that goes around here, the zygomatic, which creates the orbit of the eye. Not all species have that. And our eyes face forward, right? And that allows us to have a lot of depth perception, which not all species have, and allows us to grasp things easily. So if you have a can of Coke on the table in front of you and you reach out to grasp it with your hand, the fact that you can easily tell how far away it is and easily calculate the distance and grab it that's a function of the way that your eyes are positioned. And not all animals can do that either. So for instance, if you ever hear about deer jumping in front of cars and you wonder why they do that, it's because their eyes are on the sides of their head and they actually have a very poor sense of depth perception. So when your car, when your headlights are driving towards them, they don't perceive you as getting closer. They just perceive you as getting bigger. And that freaks them out. 
and then they just jump. They, they try to run away, and they don't recognize that you are rapidly moving towards them. That will never happen to us because our eyes are forward-facing. And also our snout is highly reduced. So compare us to, say, a horse, right? The entire front of our face is all mushed in, and that's true of all the other primates as well. And there's our, there are our forward-facing eyes compared to the horse's eyes also on the side of their head like a deer. Okay, what about habitat and diet? We're going to spend a lot of time on diet in a future lecture, but here we're just going to give the brief overview. So most primates are arboreal. That means they spend most of their time in the trees. That doesn't apply to us, of course, but we have a lot of adaptations that come from our arboreal ancestry. We'll be looking at those in the locomotion section. But most, of the, most primates are adapted to live in a densely forested environments. When you think about a monkey, you're right, you think about a monkey in the trees. Most primates have a generalized diet. They eat a wide variety of foods. So compared to, say, a cat, right, cats are obligate carnivores. They can pretty much only eat meat. They can eat some other things, but to survive, they have to eat meat regularly. That's not true of primates. Um, they have different diets, and we'll look at the variation in primate diet, but most primates can eat a wide variety of things. Chimpanzees, which are our closest relative, have a diet similar to ours. They eat everything. They eat a lot of plant foods, fruits, seeds, nuts, leaves, flowers, but they also eat insects. So on the bottom here, this is the classic chimpanzee behavior. They fish for termites and ants using a, a reed. We'll look at some examples of that. And they also eat larger animals that they hunt and kill. So chimpanzees are known to hunt and kill smaller monkeys. It doesn't happen very often, but they do do it on a regular basis. And then they share that food amongst themselves. And because they have a generalized diet, they have generalized dentition. So we have the same types of teeth as all the other primates, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. And this is why we covered dentition so much in the anatomy section. In addition to section and aging from dentition, it also tells us a lot about diet, and we're going to have a whole section on primate diet next week and the variation in primate dentition. Okay, what about primate behavior? What are the markers of primate behavior? And as we go through these, you can think about us. Do these things mark our behavior? They should all be familiar to you. So most primates are diurnal. That means they're active during the daytime. We're mostly active during the daytime, right? Most of us are hopefully not up at three in the morning. Most primates are not either. They're social. They like to live in groups, right? No quarantine for these guys. They have a dependence on learned behavior from their parents. So just like we rely on parents or adults to teach us a lot of things when we're children, other primates behave in that same way. A lot of them learn how to get food from their parents. They're not instinctively able to just go out and gather the best food. They're uniparous. So like humans, most primates give birth to only one offspring at a time. They don't have litters like cats or dogs. They have extended juvenile periods. So most primates are babies for a long time. They rely on their parents to take care of them. Unlike, say, a horse, which is able to walk pretty soon after it's born, a few hours, and then becomes independent quite quickly. And there's a strong bond between mothers and offspring, just like in humans. What about anatomical similarities? Most primates, and we'll look at the exceptions, but most primates have opposable thumbs. Most primates have tactile pads on the tips of their fingers and toes. And we have that. We just don't think about it. So your fingertips are very sensitive. And if you make a little squeeze like that, you can feel that your fingertips are sensitive and there's a little pad there, right? And that allows us to have a sensitive sense of touch, which allows us to do a lot of de delicate manipulation with their hands, which a lot of animals can do. Again, we have nails instead of claws. We have color vision. A lot of species don't have color vision. 
And this is a big trade-off. So we're terrible relative to most animals at smelling and hearing, but we have excellent vision and depth perception. And so we rely on that in order to evaluate our environment, right? So when you hear a weird noise, what do you do? You turn around and you look to see where the noise is. A lot of animals don't have to do that. They just follow the noise. We can't do stuff like that, but we see great. So why is that? Why did primates evolve colored vision? There's a couple of theories. One is that it's a selective advantage for fruit eating. A lot of primates eat fruit. Unripe fruit's not good for you. Ripe fruit is more nutritious. And in order to pick the ripe fruit, you have to be able to see what color it is. And so as a result, humans, apes, and most old world monkeys have the same vision range. They see in trichrome, which is blues, greens, and reds. And there's an example of why. So these are mangoes. The mango on the left is unripe, it's very green. The yellower it gets, the sweeter it is. And by the time it's orange red on the far right there, it's delicious and ready to eat. And you wanna be able to distinguish that actually relatively subtle color gradation in order to pick the best fruit. And so we can do that and so can most other primates. We also have extremely large brains relative to body size compared to other mammals. So Whales have huge brains, but they also have huge bodies. Squirrels have tiny brains, right? And most monkeys and apes have relatively large brains. Humans have the largest brain relative to body size, but that ratio continues down through the other primates. This is very metabolically expensive. Brains take up a lot of energy, and bigger brains take up more energy relative to your body size, which means it's more difficult to gather energy. And so this is an evolutionary trade-off, and a huge question in evolutionary studies is, why did we make that trade-off early on? Now it's obvious what having big brains does for us, but when you first develop a big brain and there's no technology to exploit, how do you survive um, pain for that big brain? And there are a couple of different theories for why that might be. One is the social intelligence hypothesis. So... The idea here is that primates live in social groups for the most part, and as those groups get bigger, right, the network expands and their social relationships become more complex. And in order to keep track of that, you need more brain power. And knowing who you can trust in your group and who you can't trust um, has a large evolutionary advantage. If you can keep track of the 10 people who will help you and the 15 people who won't help you, then you can expend resources in an intelligent way, and that requires a lot of brain power. Another hypothesis is the ecological foraging hypothesis. And this says that since primates eat an extremely varied diet um, that has a lot of different things to keep track of in it, they need to have large brains to keep track of all that. And we see that modern primates tend to move around a lot in their environment. They remember where certain things are. So they remember when a certain fruit gets ripe in a certain place. They remember that a certain tree grows a lot of nuts and they keep going back to those places. And in order to do that, you also need a large brain in order to remember all that stuff and then calculate that it's time to go to that particular location. Another possibility is that in order to get some of those foods, for instance, nuts, you have to know that this thing, like a walnut, for instance, a walnut is just an ugly, hard lump. The nut is in there, but it's hard to get out. So in order to know that this food item has to be processed and extracted um, and to remember how to do that and to pass that knowledge on to your offspring, that's extremely complicated, even for us, right? And so... Primates may have evolved large brains in order to do that better. But the real answer is that we're not sure. These are just hypotheses, uh, and they haven't been solidly proven. There are primatologists studying both of these and other possibilities uh, right now. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a break point. So in the recorded lecture, I'm going to cut it at this point and then go to Another, a new video so that things can be broken up a little bit. <clears throat> Let's look at primate taxonomy. There are two approaches to primate taxonomy, and we're going to not do the one on the left, the evolutionary taxonomy approach. We're going to do the one on the right, but I just give them both to you so you know that they both exist. 
So in evolutionary taxonomy, primates are split into two suborders, the prosimians, which are kind of more more like raccoons, basically, raccoons and squirrels, except that they happen to be primates, and we'll look at these the examples of them, and then the anthropoids, which are basically all the familiar monkeys. We're not going to use that one. We're going to use what's called a cladistics approach, where we look at physical similarities. And in cladistics, the primates are broken down into the strepsirines, lemurs and lorises, and strepsirines just means wet noses. So the rhines, the, the rhino, right, is your nose. Streps is wet. And the haplorines, dry noses, tarsiers, monkeys, apes, and humans. And we'll look at why the strepsirines are strepsirine and the haplorines are haplorine in a second. All right. So this is the family tree of primates that we're going to follow. And this slide is repeated multiple times throughout the lecture. So don't worry about taking notes on it. I will keep referring back to it. This is the basic family tree we're going to use. So we have primates divided into strepsirines and haplorines. The strepsirines are divided into lemurs and lorises. The haplorines are divided into tarsiers, often their own little group, and then anthropoids. And the anthropoids are divided into new world monkeys, old world monkeys, and apes. And below each one, I've written the main characteristics, but the rest of the lecture is going to be going through this family tree in detail. So again, don't worry about memorizing these characteristics right now. This is just for reference, and we will dive into it. All right, so lorises. Lorises are strepsirines. This is a loris on the right here. That's also a loris. You can see they don't look very much like us, but notice his little hand there. They do have the familiar features, but they also have a lot of differences from, say, us. Unlike most primates, lorises are nocturnal. That's why they have big, gigantic eyes, because they need to take in as much light as they possibly can. They don't have a fully enclosed eye. They have what's called a post-orbital bar. And we'll look at an example of a post-orbital bar. So they have a loop of bone going around the eye, but they don't have any bone back here behind the eye. The eye orbit's not fully enclosed. They're not relying on vision. They're relying on smell. So again, pretty different from most primates. And they have what's called a rhinarium. So on the end of their nose, and you can see it right right there, right? they have a damp pad, just like a dog does. So if you think about a dog's nose or a cat's nose, right? if you touch it, it's wet on the end, and that's to help uh, bring in um, enzymes, basically, for, for smelling. And we don't have that, and most primates don't have that, but these guys do, and that's where the name of their entire group comes from. So strepsirine, wet nose, they have a rhinarium. Their diet is mostly insects. They eat some gum from trees. So if you think about sap leaking out of a tree, like a pine tree, some trees have a, a harder version of that, and that's edible. It's got a lot of nutrients in it, and lorises eat that. And they have a different dental formula than everybody else. So they have a 2133 dental formula. They have an extra premolar. They also have something called a dental comb, and we'll look at that in a second. So their incisors are modified in order to be a scraper so they can scrape up bark and they scrape up the bark in order to pick out insects that live under the tree bark and then to get gum from the tree. Okay, so here's the post-orbital bar. So you can see that in a human, right, this would all be bone back here, and they don't have that. So their eye is actually exposed on the side of their skull, and to keep the eye in place, they just have this ring of bone that goes around, and that is relatively unusual. And this is a dental comb. So this is the lower jaw of the loris, and you can see the front incisors are all morphed together and are have grown out into these long, slender bits, just like a comb. And so then when they basically use that, they take their lower jaw and they scrape against the tree bark, and I'll post a video of what that looks like. Okay, the other Strepsirion family is the lemurs. The lemurs are only found on Madagascar, which is an island off the east coast of Africa, a large island, but still an island. So, Madagascar, uh, so lemurs were split off 
from all the other primates when Madagascar separated from the continent of Africa. And they evolved by themselves over there. So they're related to lorises, but they have uh, split off into their own group. And because of that, what they ended up doing was radiating out and filling a lot of niches uh, in Madagascar and ecology. So there are a lot of kinds of animals that don't exist in Madagascar. And lorises, or sorry, lemurs have filled up all those spots. So there's no raccoons, but you have a primate that's kind of like a raccoon. There's no squirrels, but you have a primate that's kind of like a squirrel. There's no monkeys, but you have a primate that's kind of like a monkey. And so because of that, they're very diverse um, and they have all kinds of different behaviors. Some of them are nocturnal, some of them are diurnal, some of them eat insects, some of them eat tree gum, some of them eat fruit. And so they're, they're hard to categorize for our purposes. And we're not going to look too much at lemurs in detail. We just need to cover the fact that they exist. So, like lorises, they also have a post-orbital bar, not an enclosed orbit. They have long snouts, um, unlike most primates. And they're more dependent on smell than they are on vision compared to monkeys and apes. So just like a loris, they have a rhinarium, right? They have a wet pad at the end of the nose. They have a 2133 dental formula, and they also have a dental comb. All right, so that's all the strepsorines, and we'll, look, we'll come back to them when we look at diet and locomotion in the upcoming lectures. All right, so then you have the tarsiers, and the tarsiers have often been grouped with the strepsorines because they're sort of morphologically similar, but the main thing is that they have a dry nose, and so for our purposes, they go into the haplorines. Tarsiers, and you can see they're tiny. Tarsiers exist in Southeast Asia. They're very small. They mostly eat insects. Uh, they have a lot in similarity with a squirrel in behavior, kind of. Um, well, Squirrels don't eat insects, but they're very arboreal. They're nocturnal. They're genetically quite close to anthropoids. And they don't have a dental comb. They don't have a rhinarium. And they do have a closed bony orbit instead of a post-orbital bar. So cranially, they're much more similar to monkeys. And they have a lot of unique features. So they have an uh, uneven, an asymmetrical dentition. Their upper dentition is 2133, just like lorises and lemurs, but their lower dentition is 1133, so one incisor and only. They have extremely large eyes, as you can see, because they're nocturnal. And they can turn their head almost 360 degrees, so extreme rotation, like an owl's head. And they have a fused tibia and fibula. So the lower bones in their legs are fused together because their main form of locomotion is leaping. And again, we'll look at that in a locomotion module. The main way they get around is they jump off of trees and then just grab onto the next tree and they can jump uh, extremely far. So those are tarsiers. Again, not as important for our purposes. We're mostly interested in anthropoids. And so now we'll move on to the anthropoids. And the anthropoids covers all the monkeys and all the apes. So compared to the species you've looked at so far, we tend they tend to be larger, relatively big-brained. Again, mostly diurnal, relying on vision over smell, having color vision, a full bony enclosure for their eyes, and a 2123 dental formula. And so these are all things that describe us, right? And we are uh, in the order of anthropoids. So here's a map summary, the different kinds of anthropoids. You have new world monkeys in the new world, mostly South and Central America, old world monkeys in the old world, that's uh, Asia and Africa, there are no monkeys in Europe, gorillas and chimpanzees centered in Central Africa, and gibbons exclusively in Southeast Asia. And so we can compare those two groups, New World monkeys and Old World primates. So New World monkeys obviously inhabit the New World. They're known as platyrines. They have a flat nose, and we'll look at an example of that. Old World primates are called catarines. They have a downward pointing nose. So a lot of the morphological differences are in the nose, 
New World monkeys have a broad nose, their nostrils face sideways, and they have a wide septum. And the septum is the little, the bar in the middle of your nose that some people get a piercing in, the septum piercing. So New World monkeys have a wide one. Old World monkeys have an extremely narrow one. They have a narrow nose and their nostrils point downwards. New World monkeys have three premolars. So in the dental formula, it'll be two, one, three. And old world monkeys have two premolars, so it'll be two, one, two. So, new world monkeys. This is my favorite new world monkey, the howler monkey. Uh, we have these at my site in Belize. They do this exact thing. They sit in the trees and scream at you. So, new world monkeys live in Central and South America. They're mostly arboreal, i.e. they live in the trees, and diurnal, they're out during the daytime. And they rely either on insects and tree gums for the very small ones. And we'll look at some examples of small ones. And the larger ones eat fruits and leaves. So this guy, the howler, he eats fruits and leaves. A lot of New World monkeys have a prehensile tail. So their tail is long and they can actually use it to grasp things like a fifth limb. And we'll look at some examples of that in videos. That doesn't exist. There are no, no Old World monkeys with prehensile tails, that's a feature of New World monkeys only. So there's an example of prehensile tail use. Right, This individual is using his tail to hold himself up. His legs are completely free, and his forearms are being used to grasp something. And then we have one kind of New World monkey that is an exception to a lot of rules, so we'll be talking about them again. It's the tamarins. They're extremely small primates. And one of their unusual features is that they tend to have twins instead of single births, and they tend to be polyandrous. So that's multiple males mate with each female, and then all the males group together with the one female, and they raise their kids in a group. Then on the other hand, we have the old world monkeys. So we have here a baboon, classic, and here a galata. Old world monkeys live in Africa and Asia. They're also generally diurnal. They live in large social groups. So when you see baboons, there's usually a lot of baboons in one place. Those are called troops. <clears throat> they move on all fours. They're not arboreal for the most part. So you see them on the ground like this, walking around. And for that reason, they have a lot of analogous characters to dogs, which we'll be looking at in the locomotion section. They have what are called bilophodont molars. So their molars have parallel ridges on them. So if all we have is part of a cranium with a dentition from one of these organisms, right, we can identify it based on the bilophodont molars. And they have what are called ischial callosities, which are, uh, sorry, ischial callosities, which are special patches of skin on their butts. And most of them have tails, but not prehensile tails. So on the right, we have a bilophodon molar. There are two ridges that run directly across the surface of the tooth. And these are ischial callosities. So on their ischium, think back to your skeletal anatomy, on their ischium, they have a rough, hardened patch of skin because they spend a lot of time sitting down. And so this is a common feature of old world monkeys. And then old world monkeys can be further divided into two groups. So you have the colobines and the cercopithecines. Colobines include the langers and the colobus monkeys, and they're mostly in Asia. They're medium-sized, so the average size you would think of for a monkey, with long tails, and they mostly eat leaves, so they have special adaptations for leaf eating. They have very complex stomachs, and we'll look at their stomachs some more in the diet section. On the other hand, you have the circopithecines. Those are baboons and macaques. They are larger than colobines, so baboons especially are quite large. They're found mostly in Africa, although there are some Asian macaques. They're relatively short-tailed, and a lot of them have cheek pouches for storing food. So two classic examples. The colobines, you have the proboscis monkey from Borneo, where the males have this large exaggerated nose. 
And the circumpithecines, the great example is the Japanese macaques. So if you've ever seen these pictures of the monkeys in the hot springs in Japan, those are old world monkeys and they are circumpithecines. All right, so that covers all the old world monkeys and now we can move on to the apes. So that includes us, apes, group hominoids, uh, is gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and ourselves. So, what are the similar, the unifying characteristics of hominoids? They're all found in Central Africa and Southeast Asia, except for us, of course, we're everywhere now, but we originate in Central Africa. They're all catarines, so their noses face downward, our nose faces downward, and they have narrow septums, we have a narrow septum. They have prognathic faces, so their faces project more. Think back to those old world monkeys, right? They have very flat faces, and we have relatively sticking out faces, just like gorillas and chimpanzees. They have really big brains relative to their bodies, even more so than monkeys. And of course, we fit in that pattern quite well. They're diurnal, we're diurnal. And they have adaptations for swinging in trees, which is called brachiation. So they all have flexible shoulder joints, uh, a differently shaped scapula, and a very long arm to leg ratio. We, of course, don't swing in trees very much anymore, but we have the structures that would allow us to do so. We'll look at that also in the locomotion section. And we do have flexible shoulder joints, a similarly shaped scapula, and a relatively long arm to leg ratio. Whoops. Apes also have a 2 1 2 3 dental formula. We have that. They don't have tails. We don't have tails. And all apes, including us, have what's called a Y5 molar. So each molar has five cusps with a Y-shaped groove in between them. And there's a diagram of what that looks like on the left with an example of a chimpanzee molar on the bottom there. So when you see that Y-shaped or horseshoe-shaped um, formation on the molar with the five cusps, you know you have an ape. And so when we look at fossil individuals and all we have is say a fragment of a jaw like on the bottom there, we can still tell where they fall in the lineage if we can see that Y5 molar formation. So we'll look quickly at the different kinds of apes. So there are lesser apes. The lesser apes just include gibbons and siamangs. There's a gibbon on the top there and a siamang on the bottom. They're pretty similar. They're tailless. They're relatively delicate compared to the other apes. So they have very delicate jaws and teeth. Um, gibbons form monogamous pair bonds and they have low sexual dimorphisms. So there's not much physical difference between males and females. And they're all found exclusively in Southeast Asia. They're mostly arboreal, so gibbons mostly brachiate. You can see all they're always pictured like this with their arms hanging in trees. They can walk around on the ground, but they prefer not to. And so in order to uh, do that, they have extremely long arms. And if you can think back to the classroom, in the corner we have that gibbon skeleton where his arms from his shoulders reach all the way to his feet. And I'll post some videos of gibbons doing things because they're hilarious um, and they are fascinating when they move around. Then you have orangutans. Uh, these guys only live in born in Indonesia. They're extremely sexually dimorphic. So you can see in that picture you have a male orangutan on the left and a female with a child on the right. They have a dish-shaped face, which is going to be a characteristic of some human ancestors later. They're diurnal. They're slow climbers. So they are arboreal, but they're not very good at it, unlike gibbons. And they're solitary. So most primates are social. Orangutans are not. They spend a lot of time alone and mostly come together to mate. Dominant males, and this is a dominant male in the picture here, get these cheek flaps that develop later in life. Adolescent males don't. They look more like females in the face. They're foragers. So they mostly eat fruit. Unlike chimpanzees, they don't eat meat. They eat whatever they can kind of find around them. And they're highly intelligent. They can use tools. They like to mimic humans. So there's lots of uh, you know, stuff on social media of orangutans doing things like paddling a boat or fishing. Um, and they mostly do that when they observe humans doing it and then copy them. 
but they have the ability to to do a lot of different things. Okay, then you have gorillas. Gorillas are, gorillas are the largest primate. The males, of course, are larger than we are. Um, they live in family groups consisting of one dominant adult male with several adult females that he mates with and then all the children from those matings. And we'll look more at that when we look at primate family structure in two lectures. They're exclusively herbivores, so they eat mostly leaves and grass. They don't eat, say, meat or insects like chimpanzees do. And they are terrestrial knuckle walkers. So in these pictures, you have the classic gorilla form of locomotion. They walk on the front knuckles of their hands. We'll look at that also in the locomotion section. They can stand upright, but this is their typical form of getting around. And then you have the, the last group, chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans. Uh, and so I put babies of all three species down on the bottom there to show the similarities. Chimpanzees and bonobos are extremely similar physically. Most of their differences are in behavior. Um, they are our closest living relative biologically, and they both live in equatorial Africa, where we're also from originally. They have an extremely variable diet, so fruits, leaves, nuts, insects, small animals, they eat pretty much everything. They live in large, multi-male, multi-female social groups. And bonobos tend to have a slightly leaner body than chimps, but the big difference is that chimps are relatively violent. They do things like raid other groups of chimps um, and fight each other. And bonobos are relatively nonviolent and they have a lot of sex. So the big way that bonobos uh, address conflict within their groups is they have sex to work it out. And we'll look at that more in family groups as well. And then you have humans, so we're great apes. We have relatively limited sexual dimorphism. We have a special adaptation, which is we walk upright on two legs. That's very unusual, and we'll have a whole section devoted to discussing that in some depth. And we have extremely large brains, which drives a lot of our evolutionary history. And so in the next week's lecture, we'll look at the details of primate behavior uh, and life, and then we'll link those behaviors and life to our own behaviors and life to understand why humans are the way they are. So that's the lecture for this week. I will be posting this up as videos cut into sections so you don't have to watch the entire lecture all at once. Here's the assignment for this week. Um, it's lab 10. For both lab manual versions, the questions are the same. Do exercises one through five. For each question, there's material in the appendix, which is the pages right after the lab questions. So mostly this is looking at skulls and other parts of different kinds of primates and identifying them. Um, and then you can turn that into me any way you like, as I detailed in the announcement. Do next week before class that lab 10 document. There's also going to be an extra credit assignment. It's already posted, but I just haven't published it yet. If you're interested in getting some extra credit, take a look at that. And then I'll be posting some additional resources and videos uh, illustrating some of the points from today's lecture for you to look at as well. So that is the entire lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, then feel free to ask me in chat. Or if you don't want to ask me right now, uh, you can contact me at a later time. Um, I'm going to end the stream and then turn it back on so that I can cut this up into two different sections. So let me just do that real quick and then I'll be right back. Okay, so I'm going to stay live here, and if you have any questions, then feel free to ask away. Um, otherwise, hope you have a great week. If you have any questions about the material, please contact me, and I will be sending announcements as I post 
additional material uh, in the near future. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and also, if you have any feedback, if this was good, not good, uh, something I could do better, something you would like to see different, if you think having me live from the lectures is, is not a good way of learning, anything like that, I would love to hear about it. Feel free to send me an email. Um, I would like to do whatever I can to make this class you know, worthwhile for everybody. So please feel free to let me know what you think.